Okay. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Here we come to the, our next class on uh, land law. So today we'll go through the question. Uh, okay, there's not much, uh, how to say, uh, uh, substance of the land law that we are going to discuss, but I will rather share with you how to identify the issues uh, uh, in our past year question. Okay. So again, I would like to make some disclaimers that I'm just a pupil in chamber. I'm not a qualified lawyer yet, but hopefully this class of mine will serve like a personal opinion and also like a little bit of uh, guidelines to you, you guys in answering the question. Okay. Uh, wait, uh, a lot of people are joining. Uh. I have to manually click and admit them, right? Okay, uh, to me, I think professional practice uh, is actually one of the toughest paper that you are going to face in your CLP exam, you know, because we have uh, five questions to answer in total. And then actually you are quite rushing in your time, right? And uh, it is also happens that uh, our land laws uh, questions are designed in a manner that it's very lengthy, you know. So multiple issues can be consisted in just one question. So by the time you finish reading question, in fact, I have time myself. Last time, my maximum time for me to digest the question as, as well as to identify the underlying issues would take me around 5 to 10 minutes. Okay, so you are just left with uh, less than 30 minutes, you know, to answer the question. All right, so um, please make sure that you can understand. I mean, uh, you know your laws beforehand, okay? I don't think we have much time to flip through the statute during the examination. Huh? So you must be well aware with the facts that you are rushing time, okay? Uh, okay, the land law, sorry, uh, a, lot, a lot of students joining. Uh. Okay, Malaysian land law is somewhere, it's quite a complicated area, you know. But fortunately, in CLP, we do not need to understand all the areas of uh, land law per se. So the, you have to zoom in yourself, lah, okay? For example, these are the popular questions that you must know, fingertip, you know. Land law, unlike bankruptcy, uh, I mean insolvency and also winding up, as well as your probate, you have three choices, you know. In fact, sometimes you can finish up your profit PP paper by just doing three questions, okay? Three land law questions. I'm a good example lah, because in the previous year, I feel that I was more confident to answer land law questions rather than uh, other subjects. So I ended up uh, doing three land law questions, okay? So these are the area that you must zoom in uh, in your studies, right? So this is, among others, equity issue in law and also types of title, disposal of state land, as well as your Section 340, National Land Code, your dealings, restraint of dealings. Uh, restraint of dealing don't miss, you know. Anyhow, out of three choices of question, sure there will be one uh, question uh, particularly dedicated for this area, restraint of dealings. That is inclusive of your charges, private caveat, registrar caveat, or even land holder caveat. Okay. And also this uh, uh, housing developer issue. Okay. Housing developer issues. This is uh, not inside your national land code, but it, it can come up. It can come up. Okay, because it's part of your syllabus. Okay, many people are joining still. Huh? Wait, huh? okay. So this is uh, year 2021, question number five. So what I'll do now is I'll read through the question for you. And then subsequently, uh, we can identify the issues and then you can refer to my suggested answer. Okay, this is how we are going to do this class. Very simple, just relax. Uh, feel free to, to ask as well as to comment. No problem, eh? Okay. 
So this uh, Erico here, right? We have one Erico. He has a piece of land and then he needed money to finance his restaurant business. So after that, what Arico did, Arico approached Easy Bank for a loan and Easy Bank assured that Arico that it can grant him a loan for the sum of 500,000 ringgit. Eh? Many are joining. Uh. Just bear with me. Uh. So sometimes I may get interrupted because I need to admit them. Otherwise, they'll text me separately. You know. So based on the security of a first party legal charge, over Arico's land, right? So Arico is the borrower, as well as he charged his land to Easy Bank in return of 500,000 ringgit. So this is called first party legal charge. Eh? Sometimes we can have a situation we call third party legal charge. That means uh, the borrower and also the landowner are different person. Okay, this is applicable in the law as well. Eh? So the charge documents were duly prepared by Easy Bank solicitor, Chekak, and then signed by both Arico and Easy Bank. Okay, so documentation was signed. I assume this is Form 16A, lah, right? And then Arico had also duly deposited the original IDT to the land with Chekak. Who is Chekak here? Chekak is Easy Bank solicitor. All right, who we'll proceed to present the charge of for registration on 10 of May 2020. Thereafter, advise Easy Bank to release the loan sum to Arico. Okay, you must understand. Huh? Okay, so now Chekap is representing the Easy Bank. Easy Bank had loaned 500000 to Arico and then on the first party legal charge. So. Chekap here is the solicitor, you know. He presented to land office or the land registry in order to get this registrar, uh, I mean, the, the in order to get the charge to be registered. Otherwise, uh, at this stage, uh, even though Arico had signed the documents, but the charge is not registered with the land office or the registry, okay, it is not yet a so-called registered uh, charge, you know, under our National Land Code. At this stage, huh, it is deemed as equitable charge because never registered. One thing that you go with land law, huh, you must understand the differentiation between equitable charge and also the registered charge. Okay, so this is the issue. Huh? Everything signed, the money released, but then the charge is not yet registered. Can get me, eh? Okay. So what happened next? A week later, Chekap realized that the registration of the charge was actually rejected by land registry. See, land registry here, as there is no quit rent receipt was attached together with registration. That means to say there's some endorsement of tenancy. So during the presentation itself, you cannot simply register without the quit rent receipt because tenancy, will get some uh, protection in the law. Just understand this way, okay? So meanwhile, Arico had gone to visit his relatives overseas for summer holidays and only returned home four months later. That means to say there's some delay in getting the quit rent receipt, okay? So Chekap subsequently obtained the quit rent receipt from Arico opened his return and represented the charge for registration on 20th October 2020. There's a gap of five months here. Eh? Later on, I'll do a chart to explain myself better. Okay, so Chirkup's presentation was again rejected as there was a private caveat entered on the set lane by one Misra on 15 September 2020. Just take note of the date here. So before he's managed to present himself to register the set charge for Easy Bank 500k, okay, there is already one private caveat entered by Misra. So who is Misra here? So the facts further elaborates who is Misra. So on investigation, it was noted that Misra had entered into a 
SPA with Mariko in 2018. You can see, huh? so Ms. Ma actually wanted to buy Mariko's land. But then something had happened. Lah, right? He had paid 2% earnest deposit, but subsequently the SPA, the sell and purchase transaction did not go through. All right, Misra refused to remove the private caveat on the land as Ariko had forfeited the earnest deposit sum. Okay, and Misra actually, what she want is she uh, wanted the land back or she wanted the money back? Okay, the facts already provide you the answer. Misra wants the earnest deposit to be refunded to him. Okay, it's a him actually. Okay, Chirka also noticed that PO, a prohibitory order, had been entered on the said land, but against Erico at High Court. So, prohibitory order was actually entered on 1st of June 2020. So, you have actually four dates here, right? Four dates. This is all prior to uh, the date of 20 October, in which Chekak, for the second time, uh, he tried, uh, tried to enter the uh, charge. All right. So be clear on that. Thereafter, Soda Supply had not done anything further on the said matter. That means to say, after the PO entered by right, huh, you must understand also, PO is obtained by Soda Supply on the basis that probably, probably like this one, Erico had all Soda Supply some sum of money. And then Soda Supply sued Arico in the court. Subsequently, Soda Supply got the judgment. You know? That means to say, okay, so and so Arico need to pay Soda some of money. And then realizing that Arico got a piece of land, uh, but does not have, presumably, uh, does not have any other asset. What Soda Supply did was enter a WSS first and then issue a PO. That means to stop that land belong to Arico from further dealing. Arico cannot sell the land because after that, what is going to happen would be after the PO enter, okay, soda supply can actually proceed with order for sell. Okay, I hope you are quite clear with this, this concept. Huh? So meanwhile, Arico also defaulted payment uh, of the loan to Easy Bank. So Easy Bank intends to commence foreclosure action and obtain an order for sale on Arico's land to recover the entire loan sum. Right, so check up advice Easy Bank that there are ways for Easy Bank to recover the loan sum from Arico by way of order for sale. So what are the necessary actions Easy Bank should take to recover the loan given uh, by, by it to this uh, Arico? Your answer must refer to relevant provisions of National Land Court and decided case. Okay. So you have multiple issues. I just make myself uh, one more time uh, just to make you all understand. Okay. So check out borrow money from Easy Bank. Make it very lamentum. Uh. So she, he put uh, uh, this uh, uh, check up is actually the lawyer here. Uh, okay. On behalf of uh, Easy Bank, he wanted to do a registration of charge, but somehow or rather, his uh, efforts uh, are futile because of uh, quick rent notice. Okay, on 10th of May, he tried to enter but rejected because uh, the quick rent notice was not served to him. And then subsequently, he tried to enter again on 24th of uh, October, again got rejected. Why? Because there are two things here. Misra punya private caveat and also prohibitory order entered by soda supply. Okay, so now uh, the status of the charge is still remain equitable. Can you all follow me so far? I need to know. Can you all follow me? The whole storyline. Very, very clear. Can I? Okay, this one is very important. You know, you don't you don't get it, then a bit difficult. Later you cannot understand uh what my answers are. Okay, so understand uh, this chart, please make sure. So subsequently, what the question asks us to do, 
because Chirkap had advised Easy Bank that he it can actually proceed with order for sale, you know. Okay, so we need to focus our discussion. Okay, whether equitable charge can actually proceed to order for sale, or we need to get the charge registered. And these are the obstacles uh, on the road that we need to remove in order for us to proceed with order for sale. Okay, so we need to discuss it step by step. Okay, in our answer. Right. So, so this is my suggested version of answer. Eh? So I'll make a very brief outline. That means uh, my introduction. Uh, usually I'll just copy whatever they told me. Lah. I will I will confirm the nexus between the parties first because now you have several parties. The Chirka as a solicitor, Erico is the land owner, okay, and also Easy Bank. All right, so we need to we need to highlight the relationship first. So I will put myself in, in this way. A charge is a transaction where the registered proprietor of alienated land are recourse convey uh, it as a security to Easy Bank for the repayment of the loan. So I make it very clear, okay. As a consequence of Chirkup's failure to register the charge timely with land registry pursuant to section 243 national land code because in order to get protection uh, in law you know right registrable uh, type of uh, uh, dealings will be only four uh, the transfer lease easement and also charge okay these four things can be registered you know recognized by the statute after these four things register, uh, you will deem to have indivisible title one, you know. So this one is very important. Uh. So this thing, I mean, this charge itself, unfortunately, is not being registered on time. I repeat myself again. So this is equitable charge. And it is luckily recognized by the Court of Malaysia. So you can use one case here, Mahadevan against Manila and Sons. Okay, but this uh, provision is very important. Section 243, National Land Code. Okay. And on the issues whether equitable uh, charge could proceed to order for sale, the court took the two different views. Okay. One is Malayan Banking against Dahari Ahmad. It says that an equitable charge has right of sale. Another will say differently. Okay, Oriental Bank again, Chapsang Restaurant. Uh, you see, these are the different approach by the court because in order for you to invoke something equity in the court, uh, you must have a very good reason, you know, because you need to invoke your section three, section six, some more, uh, and equity equitable in uh, interest. Huh? This sort of thing, huh? you must come with clean hand. So the court actually will scrutinize every single fact of the case before the court can intervene. Okay? You, you understand? Huh? The court want to intervene means champo tangan with the equity, you know. That means to say, uh, this land national land court, huh? it has to power with the equitable principles, you know. So court usually will have two different attitudes. One, they'll say no. I will just go with the statute. Another one uh, will open their door because equity will always prevail over any written law. Okay, you all know the principle, isn't it? So these are why they are always contradicting answers for that. Okay. But in examination, do not talk so much about the theories. You have to submit yourself because we have to think of the interest of Easy Bank now. Now, Easy Bank, uh, he got stuck with the registration. So you have to submit your answer in a way that it is more favorable uh, for Easy Bank. So what I'll submit is in reliance to Zahari Ahmad Supra, Easy Bank may proceed with order for sale as equitable charge. But Easy Bank must solve the following issues. Remember the issues that we have talked about, the quick rent, the private caveat, as well as there's a PO, you know. So three things we need to solve. Otherwise, you cannot conclude your answers here. It's hanging, okay? 
Can understand, huh? Until now. <coughs> okay, we proceed, huh? So quick ran notice is very easy because checkup already acquired the notice. So he need to tender to the land registry for their acknowledgement, you know, in order to remove the tenancy endorsement. Why is that so? Huh? Because in order for you to proceed for order for sale, unless you want the buyer of the auction to buy over the previous tenancy uh, agreement, okay? Like one case of you, the hotel ambassador case. Otherwise, uh, you have to remove everything clean, you know. Because as, for example, if I'm the buyer of Arico's land, uh, I do not want it to have any encumbrance. That means no limitation. Uh. Subsequently, after buying the auction, tomorrow I can transfer the name to my daughter or sell it to third party. So this is the reason, okay? So quit rent notice is very simple. Just remove it because you got it already. But you must highlight uh, these are one of your part, uh, your marks here. All right. So second thing is the prohibitory order. So what you want to do with this prohibitory order? You must mention that uh, prohibitory order has a lifespan of six months. Because uh, why I need to put this sentence, my personal opinion is because uh, the other party, Soda Supply, did not do anything thereafter. Okay, so are they testing us on the knowledge that actually this PO has lifespan or not? Anyhow, I'll put lah. So I'll refer to Order 47, Rule 6, Rule of Court, as well as Section 338, Subrule 1, National Land Code, to say that this PO, the prohibitory order, is still valid at the material time. Lah. I mean, uh, when the time that you have your examination. Lah, okay. So, soda supply was merely the judgment creditor. This is how I go on to discuss PO. So, PO, like I have just mentioned, okay, soda supply actually just a judgment creditor that had obtained judgment from the court. Okay. He just won money back. He has no interest in the land per se, you know. So, Prohibitory order does not create any interest of the land. And then some more, uh, your section 336 uh, subrule 2, you can refer to it now. It's best for you to re refer to your national land code uh, while you are going through this revision with me. Okay, because it, this is more important than case law. As well as your Karupia Chitia case. Okay, it says that the PO actually does not prohibit the issuance of certificate of sale. Okay, it does not prohibit. Okay, I go, in, go on uh, with my argument as such. Even if it does, uh, the court will evaluate the competing interest by upholding first in first out rule. So apparently, Easy Bank had created its interest by equitable charge on 10th of May. Why I said so? Because document signed. Money 500,000 had given to Arico. So there is actually something had been done ongoing, you know. It's about it's just the registration. Uh, just, this checkup uh, is not so checkup after all, isn't it? So he did not perform his duty as a solicitor well before releasing the money. So it ends up with a lot of mess here. Uh, okay. And Sona Supply had actually entered PO on 1st June. Therefore, I'll submit as such now. Easy Bank will have priority over soda supply in proceeding with order for sale. Okay. Standard Chartered Bank against Yap Singyo. Okay. So, but you don't take it lightly, you know, when you have a PO, by right, uh, soda supply, the next step that soda supply will do will be entering into order for sale, you know. But just that there's some, there's some mistake ongoing with uh, soda supply as well. Lah. So you must submit in such a way that you already predict. Lah. Even uh, Easy Bank, you know, took the land to the court, you know, by order 83 or whatsoever, okay, to proceed with the order for sale. Subsequently, soda supply is not just going to close its eye on this issue. Because I, my right, uh, I enter into a PO, my next step will be order for sale as well, you know. Now, Easy Bank had grabbed soda supply's opportunity, you know. So, 
it ends up soda supply may be the sole loser, you know. So they will intervene, okay? They will intervene, okay? They'll add in as party, lah. that means by your order 15, rule 6, lah, the one, okay? So private caveat, huh? private caveat was entered by who? Ms. Ra. So what are the effects? Prohibit registration, okay? And also endorsement or entry of registered documents. So the land cannot be sell. Uh, pursuant to this one, very important, section 322. Memorize, uh, please, uh, memorize. Uh, at least the day, uh, like, like one week before your examination, really go through uh, uh, and be familiarized with all the, the provision of National Land Code. And you can use the case of Meccan Engineering against Go Hui Yin. And in this event, the assistance of private caveat may affect the transfer of title for Erico's land after order for sale. Okay, this is how it works out. Because private caveat is just like a statutory injunction that prohibit any dealing. All right. And then you have to mention uh, the extraction from the fact in which that Misra had refused to remove private caveat pursuant to section 325 National Land Code. So, Easy Bank is advised that there are another two ways, okay, to remove private caveat. Number one is, of course, to approach Arico, who had defaulted the payment. Uh, I mean, he's now owing you money, and then he charged his land to you. So, you can actually approach him uh, to ask for his favor uh, to remove the caveat, the private caveat, by virtue of Section 326, sub rule. One, okay, it says that uh, because he's the owner, he's a registered proprietor, so relatively, Arico will be easier, you know. He just need to tell the registrar, I'm the owner, you see, I have the IDT registered under my name. So I just fill in this form, you know, form 19A, A -A -H. okay, you can flip through if you want to have a look. Like. It's just a very, very simple, punya it was first. Uh, removal form, you know, application for removal of private caveat. You can see here, very simple, just get a sign, submit to the registrar. Subsequently, uh, the burden will be placed on uh, Misra, you know, to prove this uh, three stages test. So isn't it a better option rather than go to court? La, so, so, so. Uh, okay, so you must mention uh, section 326 sub rule 1. Section 326 sub rule 2. Okay. Ah, mention like this, ah, please. Ah. Okay. This one I exactly copy from your statute. So, second way. Second way, if I recall refused, ah, for example, the relationship had turned sour or whatsoever, right? Actually, uh, this uh, easy bank can remove the private caveat by court order section. 327 because easy bank now okay he's it is already an equitable um uh, charge isn't it because he, he by right the whole land uh, should have gone to order for sale and so that easy bank can recover the money isn't it owed by Ariko uh which had been defaulted up to date so uh easy bank here can actually apply to court under section Two three two seven, okay, three two seven. To remove the caveat, so how this uh, easy bank is going to do will be, okay. By ex parte, uh, that means single party easy bank or check blah. That means is solicitor lah. Uh, go to the court and submit one originating summon plus affidavit. So we can have the case of Tan Si Hock against DNC Bank here. So under section 327 sub rule 2, National Land Code, the registrar shall open serving the court order, make the removal of private caveat entered by Misra. So OS plus affidavit is the way. Lah, okay. Just mention it briefly. So you can write like that. After I recall, I had made the applications of uh, uh this is I think it's a mistake here after easy bank i'll correct subsequently lah. easy bank had made this application of removal of private caveat 
the burden of proof will shift to Misra, in which she needs to establish three stages uh, test according to luggage distributors against Tan Ho Teng. Okay, just remember there are three of them. First, Misra has to prove she has a capable interest. And second, Misra has a serious question to be tried in her affidavit in support. And the third one, the balance of convenience for the land to be remain a status quo under the private caveat. So you have to memorize these three stages test according to its sequence, A, B, C. That means caveat turbo interest first. Subsequently, if it pass, uh, then we go to uh, serious issue. Okay, serious question. And the third, second one pass only we move to balance of convenience, you know. Okay, so I will put my submission as such. It is submitted that Misra will fail in the first stage aforesaid because she is merely asking for the refund of her earnest deposit. And obviously, Misra is not claiming any interest or rights in the land itself. This is not a capital interest, E.M. Buxton case. Okay, so can follow me. Uh, if Misra had executed the SPA, had paid the, the what we call the earnest deposit, but subsequently her intention, I want that land badly. This is different story already. This will amount to capitable interest because she is vesting her interest you know, in the land. I want the land rather than the money. Luckily, the question did not ask us to discuss further. Lah. Otherwise, it will be very lengthy. Okay, so you conclude, you, after you have discussed the private caveat, the PO, as well as the quick rent notice, then you conclude, can sell or not? Uh, after the aforesaid issues have been resolved, uh, I will conclude in my manner. Uh, Easy Bank is advised to proceed with order for sale for registry title because it's said already in the, uh, in the, what we call, in the facts itself. So you have to be applying to high court. And then you use uh, uh, section 256 National Land Court and order 83. Okay. Land office title, I think I made a mistake here. By right, it should be removed because it is a land registry. So you just go section 256 as well as order 83. Okay. So without any valid cause to the contrary, uh, low Lilian, it is likely that order for sale shall go through. So this is my whole conclusion for question five. So it's not so difficult as long as you put your, uh, your arguments. You show that, uh, you show to the examiners that you are actually understand what is the requirement of the question and put it in a systematic way. And then most importantly, you have to settle the problems for easy bank. Okay? Can I? You have to memorize uh, something you have to memorize and understand with your heart. Uh, okay. Okay, we go to second question. Uh, question six, because we still have a lot. You know, today we are going to discuss six questions. Right. Suji planned to renovate his home in Kajang. So he has no money. Suji is poor. So he asked for his father, Tolo, who lives in Britain for a loan. So Tolo also no money. So uh, he advised his son, Suji, to apply a loan. So Tolo will agree to provide his land, landed property in Bhutan, the property as security for a loan. Again, this is charge. Okay. Suji managed to get a loan facility, 700K, from Ringgit Bank. So be aware of the party's name. Uh, Okay, based on the security of a third party legal charge created by Tolo over his property on 2nd May 2010. So the loan agreement clearly stated that the interest at the rate of 5% per annum and shall be chargeable on the loan sum. So what happened? After a few years, uh, oh, so Suji apparently is not a very good son. He defaulted in the repayment of the loan to Ringgit Bank. So Ringgit Bank decided to recall the loan facility and proceed with, again, order for sale to recover the loan from Suji. So Ringgit 
Peng, what they did, they sent a simple LOD first, the letter, uh, let, letter of demand to both Suji and Polo, okay, recalling the facility. Then it sent a statutory notice in Form 16E. Okay, whatever I underline is very important eh, as the borrower. But this uh, Form 16E did not send to the landowner here, lah, Tolo, demanding that the entire outstanding loan, sum of 658 together with interest to be paid within seven days. Eh, this one also very important, seven days from the date of notice. Uh, Suji, after that, received the so-called uh, uh, statutory notice, but did not do anything, did not respond. Eh? And Ringgit Bank had no choice lah, but to file OS for order for sale of the property itself. So OS was actually served on 20th April. Take note on this date. And subsequently, Suji noted that the originating summon was fixed for hearing on 18 April. That means to say Suji received on 20 and OS actually was fixed for hearing two days before he received the OS, you know. So he immediately contacted Ringgit Bank and he was told that because he did not attend the court ma, on 18. So order for sale already been granted by the court on 18 April. Eh? So Suji also noticed that Ringgit Bank had imposed additional lack payment penalty interest of 10% on the facility. That means to say on the loan facility itself. Lah, because he never pay, he pay lack, late, isn't it? So there are some penalty interest. So Suji Bank called Ringgit Bank again to inform them that the loan agreement does not contain any clause for additional interest. Ringgit Bank replied that, oh, it's their new policy and all customers are bound by it. Okay, this other question. Okay. Uh, right. So Tolo also contacted the Suji regarding to this matter as he came to know about the OS address to Suji. So Tolo informed Suji that actually his friend, Wan Kawan here, had written to Ringgit Bank on behalf of Tolo requesting for a redemption statement uh, offered to settle the loan on behalf of Polo as he intended to purchase the property in Batam from Polo for 900,000 ringgit. Uh, this is like a sell by private treaty already. Lah. There's a uh, quite light issue here. So Ringgit Bank did not respond to Kawan's letter but proceed to auction. Lah. Okay, Ringgit Bank, on the other hand, did not entertain what Kawan's requests, okay, via, via his letter, but proceed with the order for sale. So, however, despite five attempts, there were no successful bidders for the property. Thereafter, Ringgit Bank did not take any further action. So, on 30 September 2021, Ringgit Bank again filed an application to fix a new date for property. So, Suji Bank came to seek for your legal advice if he can challenge for order for sale made on 18 April 2020. Okay, so I have listed down the issues here. So Suji wish to renovate the house with no money. Tolo has a property in Batam. So third party charge, okay. Ringgit Bank released 700K on, correct, huh? 2.5. 2 uh, it's actually 2010, 2010. So I make the small mistake here, 2010, okay? And subsequently, Suji defaulted. So Ringgit Bank actually issued LOD to Suji and Tolo, okay? And then statutory notice was issued to Suji only, okay? Uh, subsequently, I think I my answer, I need to add in the date already because uh, why I go and read this 2020, huh? hmm. It's on 2010. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, never mind. This one, I add additional notes. Huh? Okay, you just listen to what I have listed down first. And then additional 10% is there. And then order 83 is there. Service, there's some issues. And then five times auction was done. And sell by private treaty by Gawan, huh? 900K. Okay, so in order to 
approach this question. So question A, advise Suji whether he can challenge order for sale. Support your answer with relevant decided authorities. Okay. So okay. I got the date wrong, is it? Hmm. How come? Huh? Yeah, I think that I need to change the date here. Lah. Correct, correct. Okay. Uh, Oh, during exam, they asked us to change. Uh, I have never gone through this uh, 20, uh, 21 exam, so I really don't know. I see. Okay. So, uh, supposingly, this is the question uh, because I feel that the date is a bit weird. I don't know where I got this copy and then why I got another date here. You know? hmm. But anyway, last part is 18. April, not 2020. I see. Okay, okay. So in this problem scenario, so we have to identify, first of all, uh, just forget about the date first. The date may be one issue here. At the last part of our discussion, maybe we'll add in. So we have to identify the parties first. Okay, so who is Tolo? Tolo is the property owner here and he's the charger of his property in Batam. Eh? And Ringgit Bank itself is the chargee. And Suji is the borrower because this is a third party charge. Eh? And uh, you must understand that. And Ringgit Bank had actually commenced a charge action or order for sale pursuant to Section 256 National Land Code or Order 83 ROC. Okay, against Tolo's property. Why I know it is because they issue OS plus affidavit. Okay. Uh, because Suji had default payment. So to challenge order for sale, uh, you must quickly jump into the gist of the problems. Uh, don't waste so much time because like I say, uh, the actual time for you to answer this question probably is just about 20, 30 minutes max, you know, inclusive of how you analyze the question as well as you either identify the issues, you know. So you have to be quick, okay? So as laid down in the case of low Lilian, so number one is failure to meet the con condition precedence. Uh, for example, the statutory notice and order 83. So exceptions of indivisibility, section 340, or is this unlawful or inequitable to grant the order? So after discuss this important case law, Okay, because he need to show, you need to show to the examiner that you know the existence of this uh, causes to contrary. Okay, the answer is structure in stepwise approach as follow. Okay, so how I identify the issues one by one is number one, issues with statutory notice. I will first begin uh, with my argument on section 254. Just flip to your section 254 in case you are not aware of its assistance uh, uh, at this moment. Okay. So section 254 and actually section 255, actually 255. Okay. Uh, Mention that uh, you have two forms, you know. Okay. One is form 16E, sums payable on demand instead of Form 16D. All right. So actually, the right form should be used here huh? uh, by Ringgit Bank huh? is Form 16D because apparently Suji had defaulted the payment. Okay. On part of Suji. So by right, 16D should be used instead of uh, what we call 16E. Okay. So, but in the case of Jacob against OCBC, uh, wrong form is a mere technical irregularity. Okay, wrong form is a mere technical irregularity and it could be cured so long it does not actually prejudice the, uh, the borrowers like the Tolo or Suji. But you have to identify, you cannot stop here, you know, because there are other defects open the said statutory notice. So what are them? Uh, Actually, I need to make correction, you know. Why I put this? Uh, five, actually. Mm, five. Five. Mm. 
Okay, so there are actually other defects. Huh? Number one, the duration provided in the statutory notice issued by Ringgit Bank against Tol uh, Suji was actually uh, seven days, you know, instead the requirement uh, as required by section 2551B. You can have to look, huh? okay, 1B, in which uh, it should be, uh, it should be one month, you know, it should be one month, you know, okay, not just uh, seven days, uh. please be sure with that, uh. okay. Yeah, section two five. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Section two five four. Right, right, right. It should be right already. Five four. Yes, five four. So I was right from the beginning. Why I look at this? Four. So sorry, huh? Wait, wait, wait. Okay. So where will we? Okay. So section. 254 sub rule 1b huh? okay, provides that actually by right, Suji should be given with one month of notice instead of seven days to correct the uh, mistake of defaulting payment. That means to say, actually, uh, if Suji would have paid the money within a month, okay, he should be fine. And the uh, Ringgit Bank cannot proceed with uh, order for sale. And some more, you must pay a little bit of attention, like we have discussed earlier. Suji is just borrower, and Tolo is the charger. By right, uh, this section 254 notice should be served on the charger, okay? Not just the borrower alone. So I submitted that section 254, the statutory notice part was not uh, being compliant with. So this is amount to defective in the condition precedent. This is one of the uh, causes to contrary. Okay. So in case uh, uh, you all have to pay some attention to section uh, this form 16D and 16E. Actually, the wording itself is a little bit different. But uh, like Jacobs against OCBC case, it says that. Wrong form used so long it does not prejudice any party, it should be fine. Okay, but your discussion should have gone to other collateral issues associated with this particular form. Okay, statutory notice. Ah. Okay. And what are the issues with uh, order 83 that I have identified? Ah? Because I think I got the date a bit wrong, ah, you see. Ah? Uh, but this one, I think I got, got it correct. The hearing was actually fixed on 18, uh, okay, April, and OS and affidavit was served on Suji on actually 20th of April. There was a clear breach of Order 83, Rule 2, Sub Rule 2, which warrants the cost paper to be served on Suji at least four clear days uh, before hearing. So non-compliance to actually uh, order 83 amounts to cost to contrary, okay? So this is one rule, uh, the condition precedence, you must always include statutory notice as well as order 83. So you can bring in one case, the Pavira Habit Bank against Lam Chun uh, reality, okay? So the next issue that I have identified is the penalty interest, okay? The facts are silent on the issuance of any prior notice in regard to penalty interest had been given to Suji. If there is any prior notice uh, issued to him, said that the bank will deliver you a letter, say that I wanted to increase, um, I mean, I want to impose certain penalty on you when you are late payment, okay? Uh, this is okay. Huh? I mean, this is acceptable by our court. Huh? Okay? You can refer to one case here, BSN against Fawanis. And I will submit as such huh, because the question had told us, um, you see, huh, the question told us that the loan agreement clearly state that interest at the rate of 5% per annum should be chargeable on the loan sum. Okay? But somehow uh, it does not contain any clause for additional interest, you know. 
Okay, but then my argument is that this is not additional interest. This is penalty, you know, penalty interest on the part of uh, Suji's default payment. So my point, uh, this one is my personal view. I'll submit as such. Okay. Because sometimes the facts are not adequate for you to give a conclusive idea. So I will put myself in a, in a, a safe and a, like you have a choice, la, something like this, I'll put. Largely depends on the careful construction of the loan agreement, huh? bank policy clause, because usually they'll have one huh? inside the loan agreement. So the imposition of penalty interest of 10% may amount to a cost to contrary. Again, I use the case of Pervira, uh, Afin Bank against Eng Realty. But in some instances, uh, the court uh, may said that this sort of additional interest is not a cost to contrary if it does not prejudice the defendant. I use another case to come in with my argument. Alliance finance against uh, Gamas Prakasa. So that means here my submission is vague. I leave it to the court to decide based on the careful construction of loan agreement. Okay. Sometimes if you are not so confident, probably this is one way you can do. Lah. Okay. One way you can do. Eh? Okay. So issues with uh, sell by private PT. Okay, it is suggested that Kawan, a friend of Tolo, was keen to purchase the said property as 900k, but this uh, ringgit bank did not bother the offer made by Kawan, isn't so? So actually, the court took different approaches in dealing with the issues of sell by private treaty because this is uh, something that the national loan land court is silent to, you know, it means the land court did not. Uh, actually provide whether when the auctions have been ongoing, uh, you can sell to external party or not without going through the auction. That means you do not need to bid uh, for the auction. Okay, we have two cases here. Uh, Chattered Bank against Pakri Maidin. Uh, private treaty uh, allowed so long before proceedings have commenced. Okay, United Malayan banking against Chong Ban San. Private treaty is not allowed after an order for sale by public auction is made. So because uh, our question given, they already have order for sale and auctions for about five times, you know. So I will take the view of uh, UMBC against Chong Ban San and I will submit in the way that, uh, okay, I know this private treaty exists. I, I know you are testing me about private treaty, but I have to submit in a way that it has no recognizable issues. Otherwise, it will, it will stuck. Lah. You will stuck lah. If you want to submit that, oh, actually the, the what we call ringgit bank ah, can sell to Kawan, Nelma can sell. Later, how you want to draw a conclusion? It will be a little bit difficult, right? And you cannot use this private treaty to say this is a cost to contra contrary, you know. This is not actually provided in the case of Lo Li Lian. So I do not use this as my point. I will just dismiss it and I have uh, clearly identified this issue. Uh, this is my stand here. Lah. Uh, so based on the facts, I put it in my conclusion. Uh, there are non-compliance to statutory notice and also order 83 rule of court. It is concluded there are causes to contrary. Again, I use one popular case. Actually, you don't have to memorize so much case. You just need to know the principle and draft a nice and fancy answer. And, and, and not a lengthy one as well. You know, Seriously, uh, PP paper be safe. Huh? Otherwise, you'll end up doing only four questions. You'll be panicked afterwards. Therefore, Suji would likely to be successful in his claims to challenge the order for sale. Okay, so this is my submission. Okay. So what is our next question? Hmm. <clears throat> Suji also feels that uh, feels that the bank should be restrained for fixing a further auction date, as the bank had been unsuccessful in 
uh, all his five previous attempts to auction the said property advise Suji on his opinion. Okay, so they clearly ask whether Suji uh, uh, Suji feel in a way that he alleged that okay the the bank had tried five times already auction but never successful. So subsequent uh, auction date is it allowed or not? Okay. So I think I have no make some correction re regarding to the date of the. I didn't know this is already ten years apart. Huh? There are actually case law saying that the ten years are uh, you can go in. You know, but uh, so this is my answer for you at this moment. Let me correct the date and then get back to you with uh, proper answers. Huh? so it is track law that the court will not allow an order for sale provided causes to contrary let down by law Lillian are satisfied. So these are the main principles, you know, okay? And I will submit myself in regards that Ringgit Bank failed to sell the property in five unsuccessful auction. This matter does not actually fall into the causes to contrary a for sale. And National Land Court is silent on the maximum number or time of order of sale that could be held. So therefore, Suji could not object based on his opinion. So I try to answer whatever allegations made by Suji in this uh, in this question. Okay. Mm. So this is my submission. Lah. And uh, we go to does penalty interest term normally appear in the letter of offer? Uh, yes, actually, it is normally that's why I said uh, you must uh, go to the construction of loan agreement better. Okay, can put 259 section 2c2 for 259 state that okay. We have a look uh, at section 259, sub rule 2C. Okay. No, this one is about the reserve price. Reserve price, I agree with you. If the charge and charge are not agreeable on the reserve price, uh, order for sale can be nullified. Okay, that, that one I agree with you. But about the maximum times of uh, five times, I don't think it's quite relevant. Uh. My personal opinion, I don't think it's quite relevant in question B. Okay? Okay. As you can realize, uh, 2021 is not a very good year uh, because uh, all the questions are quite lengthy, you know. Quite lengthy. Okay, as you can see, it's like, uh, question seven. Kiko has a piece of land. Kiko entered into a joint venture agreement with Run Developer, where Run Developer will develop the Kiko's land into housing development and build and construct 10 units of double story houses there. So, subsequently, what happened? Run Developer obtained all the requisite licenses uh, for house development and obtained the duly approved uh, building plans from the relevant authorities. It also obtained the individual titles for all 10 units of houses. Before it could start constructing the house, run developer faced uh, financial diff difficulties. And consequently, what happened? The joint venture JVA la, was duly terminated by Kiko. That means the whole project gone. La. Huh. Kiko's daughter, Rajin, just returned from New Zealand after finishing her MBA degree. La. She's uh, very interested in carrying out with the development and construction of the house on Kiko's land. And Kiko actually gave Rajin a power of attorney to continue the develop, development on the said land. So what um, subsequently Rajin did, Rajin continued to build the house okay, with the plan. Okay, approved one. Huh? That one is already approved. Huh? And she also managed to sell 10 units of the house to individual purchaser already sell and purchaser also signed the SPA already. But the SPA format uh, is not the one that used in Malaysia, but rather he just copied the templates from New Zealand. Uh, okay. So subsequently, what Rajin said, Rajin said that she's not a developer and any law pertaining to housing development is not applicable to her. 
She feels that by signing the SPA, the purchasers had duly agreed. We do not know what are the terms that con contain inside the so-called SPA that she uh, brought from New Zealand. All right. And she further said that if there are any purchasers uh, were to raise any issue later, she will just terminate the SBA and sell the unit to other interested uh, new purchaser. I feel that this question uh, should do. Uh, should do Because uh, comparatively to your previous two questions, this one, uh, the standard is relatively easier. You know? So you just have to challenge the contention and allegations of Rajin based on Housing Development Control Licensing Act, HDA, as well as your HDR. That's it. Okay, we'll go through my suggested answer. Huh? Hmm. So a few issues. Huh? So uh, you when you read the question, huh, actually you can write something. You just highlight whatever issues there and quickly identify what are the um, Question one you do to, to, to do. So one of the tricks will be you read the question first, then you go to the facts of the question. Okay, understand that? Eh? So quick, quickly get settled down the issues. Okay. So Rajin obtained uh so Kiko and Run developer initially built house 10 uh, double story houses with license, but Kiko terminated. So subsequently, Rajin obtained POA. Uh, from Kiko take over projects. Does it include the license? Likely not. Okay, because second question it required us to discuss. And there are several allegations made by Rajin. So we'll address it one by one. Lah. Okay. So what are the answers? <laughs> so to advise Rajin, we have to make reference to this uh, housing development control licensing. First, if you use you, you you blank. You just copy whatever the question asks you do. Lah. And then try to make use of this abbreviation in your introduction. Okay. So later on, uh, you, your life will be easier. You know? Okay. So section three actually provide the uh, definition for housing development. That means whoever that construct, lah, whoever that construct four units of housing accommodation. Okay. That is defined as housing development and housing developer you have to define housing development first subsequently you define housing developer so housing developer means anyone okay that engage or carries on or undertakes or cause to be undertaken a housing development that means any party anyone uh, including of the the so-called liquidator uh, the the director, when uh, the company had gone uh, winding up, okay, or the person itself had gone into insolvency, the one that took over, we call director of insolvency, la, the liquidator, appointed liquidator. It is also including in, you know, this is like our policy reason, if you are interested to know, okay. So I will straight away relax to the facts, saying that according to the facts given, Rajin was actually involved in the construction of 10 units of double story house. So by virtue of section 3 HDA. So again, I said to you, you can stop using abbreviation because this is pretty long uh, statute name. You can't be possibly writing every, you know, housing development control and licensing act in the uh, part of your answer, you know. So you must... Uh, you must dispose it. You must dispose it here and after, known as HDA, in the very beginning. So this is one of the strategy that you can adopt. Now. So she's working on housing development more than four houses, and she's deemed to be house developer under the same provision. So again, after having this uh, definition, uh, you use just one simple case uh, that you can support the definition. Uh, based on this fact, you can use your Limzy on case. Uh, you can use your uh, this city investment against QPEX, in which federal court said that um, any party, especially developer, contract out of the act is an open defiance 
of the housing development legislation. Okay, that means to say HDA itself is not just of private right, lah, but of public interest. Therefore, okay, Rajin's first allegation that she is not a house developer is actually rebutted. Huh? Okay, so policy reason, because a lot of house uh, they try to build, but subsequently the house buyer bought already the house, and then the developer Larry, you know, how can, isn't it? The loan, the subs, uh, the what we call the house purchaser had to bear, but subsequently the developer uh, Larry. So not good for our country as well. Uh. So Rajin's uh, first allegation that she's not house developer was rebutted. And Rajin must strictly comply with all the legal provisions in both HDA and HDR. So this is your first submission. And secondly, uh, Rajin was building double-story houses, land units. So you must realize that uh, this already been given land units. So the second issue will, will, will be, can she use the SPA uh, from New Zealand? The answer is cannot. Uh. So you must memorize this also because HDA, HDR are not being provided during examination. But the scope of the examination regarding to this area is relatively small. You just have to memorize a few, uh, section 8, okay? Uh, this regulation also. You must memorize a little bit. Uh, okay? So, re regulation 11, HDR, provided that every contract for sale uh, and purchase of housing accommodation together with the subdivisional or portion of land, uh, this is something, a prutinant there too, shall be in the form prescribed in Schedule G. This is compulsory. Huh? Schedule G, ground. Okay, Schedule H, high land, condo. Okay, uh, high rise building, lah, apartment. Okay, so Schedule G is the right SPA. Okay, I can show you a sample of S, uh, Schedule G in the our WhatsApp group later. Okay, so Rajin had actually breached Regulation 11 by using a SPA similar to the one used by her lawyers in New Zealand. So use one case to support. You have the law, you have the case. So you are clear. Lotina against Kamuning Sutil. So the wrong SPA format, what happened? Okay, you must further elaborate that book because uh, they, the house buyers, you must remember in such a way that they already signed the agreement, okay? Uh, uh, with 10 buyers, you know. So the wrong format actually uh, will not render the contract of sale between Rajin and also her 10 house buyers to be null and void. So this is just a mistake to Malaysia law, Section 22 Contract Act. And you can use one case of uh, Audrey, the truck, the truck, okay, against Sunway, the Mon Chiara case, okay? If you just memorize Audrey, Audrey get trapped, it is also okay. Okay, so long you mention it. Okay, so Rajin goes on by saying that she could terminate the SPA should the purchasers raise any issue. So it is strike law that HDA and HDR are formulated to protect house buyers. Huh? So again, you make your policy reason very clear. You cannot terminate because you are developer here, ma. correct? The house buyers can terminate, but you cannot terminate because you are developer. Okay. Reference is made to C Housing Corporation against Li Po Chu, in which uh, in the event of contract uh, thing outside this schedule G of HDR, okay, the said contract must be uh, formulated in favor of housing uh, buyers, I mean the house purchaser. Uh, this is suggested to what, you know, that means to say, whenever you have something that varied or contract out, you wanted to add in some additional terms and conditions towards the schedule G, the court allow, but the policy reason set in. You must protect the house buyer. That means the term itself must be unfavorable, must be better for the house buyer, not otherwise. So, Rajin was wrong in the position in law, claimed that she could terminate SBA because the whole SBA that she made 
allegation and contention is uh, she can simply terminate, you know. But the law does not allow it. Eh? The law is in favorism of house buyer. Okay. And she cannot proceed lah, to sell the unit to other interested uh, new buyers. So you must list out whatever the contention, her allegation, and rebut accordingly, systematically. Okay. You understand? Eh, so far? And this question, I think, quite easy. They should do. If it comes out in this uh, come, uh, coming year exam, uh, I think you should do. Right. And uh, has Rajin committed any offence under Housing Development uh, Control and Licensing Act? Okay. So my submission uh, is on the fact it was one developer that obtained the license to construct the house under the act. Because I tried to dig, dig, dig here and there, but I could not detect any infringement of HDA, you know, I can detect there is some infringement of Regulation 11 that we have, I, we have discussed, but not HDA. The only assumption that I can derive or extract from the given facts is probably is that run developer had obtained the license, but not her. Because the joint uh, venture agreement already been duly terminated. So Rajin actually proceed to construct the house without the license as required by Section 5 HDA. So the punishment uh, was actually provided in Section 18. If she's liable and she, she's uh, found guilty and she'll be fined uh, with 250,000 ringgit, okay? Uh, and also uh, imprisonment, not exceeding five years or both, okay? So these are the things that I could find. But I further add on to the questions. Uh, because the question are uh, drafted in a manner just asked about HDA. So this one, I, I leave it to you whether you wanted to submit or not. But uh, I do not think you'll be penalized uh, if you mention Schedule G was wrong. And then pursuant to regulation, 13. Uh, this is also a penalty that might be faced by Rajin. Okay. So this is my personal opinion. Uh, so I draw a line. Okay. Okay. Allow me to drink a sip of water. Uh. Okay. Then we'll go to past year question 2022. Okay. 2022 question. So Rick sold his house in Suramban to Arif and his wife, Lily. A former SPA dated 1st February 2022 was executed between Rick, Arif and Lily. So some of the salient terms of the SPA are follows. So Arif and Lily were to pay 10% out of the purchase price as deposit sum upon execution of the agreement and the balance price was to pay, be paid now huh, within 90 days from the date of execution of agreement. So failing which the agreement will be terminated by Rick and the deposit sum paid will be duly forfeited as damages. Huh? Okay. So meanwhile, Arif entered a private caveat. So Arif apparently a house buyer lah, from uh, what we call from Rick together with his wife. So Arif being a very smart guy, enter private caveat to pro protect his interests first. Okay. Prohibit any further dealings. Okay. So unfortunately, what happened next? Arif and Lily were unable to secure any financing to enable them to make payment of balance purchase price within 90 days. So that means to say the clause Roman 2 was clearly breached lah, by on part of uh, Arif and Lily. So uh, since there's a breach here, Rick terminated the SPA and forfeited the deposit sum paid by Arif and Lily. And then despite repeated requests by Rick, Arif refused to withdraw the private caveat lodged on the title of the house. Okay, apparently this Arif was not very happy because his 10% was being forfeited already. Eh? So a week later, what happened? Rick received a notice of entry of caveat from land office in Form 19A, 
notifying that a registrar caveat had been entered on the documents of title to his house as Rick had failed to pay his income tax for many years. So registrar enter caveat on Rick's hand. So this is the second caveat that we are looking at. First, private caveat. Second, registrar caveat. Okay. So Rick made an application to registrar to remove the registrar caveat. Two weeks later, what happened? After the application, the registrar sent a reply to Rick that his applications for the removal of registrar caveats is rejected. So based on the above facts, answer the following question. Your answer must be supported by the relevant provision of National Land Code, okay? And decided case. So number one, they make it very clear uh, nowadays. You see, private caveat uh, can enter second pay, uh, private caveat or not. And then uh, registrar caveat by court order. So straightforward question. So you need to address it systematically. Okay. So we'll see one by one uh, how to uh, answer this question. Again, please, if the facts are too long, it is advisable for you to identify the parties first. I always emphasize on the parties issue. Huh? Uh, otherwise, I think you'll not be able, you, you have to you have to flip through the facts again, you know, when answering questions, which I think is not so easy. Lah. So what I do is I'll draw uh, uh, my chart for myself to make myself clear with what, what happens inside the facts, okay? So first question, uh, I'll put it in such a way. Uh, Narif had entered a private caveat on Rick's house in Seremban. Thus, Rick is the KVT and Arif is the caveat. Uh, so Arif is, is actually the house buyer, okay? Uh, and then Rick is actually the owner of the house. So Arif enter caveat. So to determine whether Rick could successfully remove the private caveat, it is on the burden of Arif to satisfy the three stages test laid down in luggage distributors. Huh? So whether Arif had caveatable interest. This private caveat, I think, uh, is quite a popular question. Uh. Every year, sure, there's one, you know. So please do not miss. Uh. My personal opinion is please do not miss this. So caveatable interest, serious question, and also balance of convenience discussed in sequence. So I will argue that since Rick had executed the SPA with both Arif and Lily, it could be saying that Arif could have caveatable interest. We refer to the case of Meccan Engineering against Go Hu Yin. Because the whole purpose uh, that you give deposit, you sign the SPA executed, that means uh, you are in a very high intention and having a high interest in purchasing the Rick's house in Seremban, you know. Okay, so this may amount to capitable interest. Clear this part, but subsequently, you discuss further. However, further details reveal that Arif was actually breaching the fundamental term of SBA by his failure to secure a bank loan and pay the balance price within 90 days. So subsequently, this amount to what? Valid termination of the SPA. And then you use another case to support your argument. So I use a case uh, that is available in the textbook. Lah. So I use the case of Chia Si Yin here to support that Arif will not have any capable interest because he did not pay. This is a valid termination of SPA. And then he will fail the first stage. Uh, of the three stages test. That means he does not actually have a caveatable interest. So this is my submission, okay? In regards to private caveat. So subsequently, second part of the question, uh, you see, uh, three stages test already you discussed. Subsequently, what are the process? So I assume there are five marks. Another five marks here. Lah. So Rick is who? So Rick is actually the owner of the property, you know. So again, he will have two options. Uh. 
Okay, you must discuss your section 326, okay, as well as your section 327. 326 provides the removal of private caveat by registrar. Again, like the previous question, okay, I said already, if you are the registered proprietor, you are the owner of the house, you just need to show to the registrar that, hey, look here, inside the IDT, actually I'm the owner, you know. I just fill in one form here, the form 19. And then subsequently, the registrar will serve a notice of intended removal uh, to Arif, pursuant to your section 326 sub rule 1A. This is all copy from your section 326, huh? Procedure is all let down. Do not copy. Make it very, very simple and sweet. Okay, talk about notice of intended removal. Subsequently, talk about the registrar will be the one that provides uh, the service of the uh, notice of intended removal. Do Arif, okay? If Arif got, uh, Arif got this uh, notice of intended removal, he did not do anything after two months. Huh? This private caveat shall be automatically removed, you know, finish, easy, okay? If Arif wanted uh, to extend the, 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 the time, like for example, after serving to him, he has to bear the test, you know, the three stages test, you know, because the burden will shift to Arif to prove the three stages test. So you must include this section as well. Section 326, sub rule 2, the two months thing, uh, and then the three stages test on the part of Kevieto, which is here, Arif, to show to that he has got cavitable interest lah, in a serious question all that. Lah. So he has to prove. Okay. So second thing ah, is, um, second method would be, you can actually remove private caveat by the court pursuant to section 327. Okay. Because Rick himself ah, is also deemed like a aggrieved person, you know, because you can uh, say that he, since he's the registered proprietor, by the existence of this uh, private cave, caveat, his interest uh, is actually being badly affected. Lah. This is my, my words of conclusion. Okay, I will use the case of uh, Eng Mei Yong here. Okay, and Rick could actually apply to the court for removal by OS plus affidavit in support. Subsequently, again, the burden will shift to Arif to satisfy the three stages test okay so three stages test you already mentioned here already you do not need to repeat uh, yourself when you are discussing the way to remove okay and then quickly you jump into a conclusion you submit because from this case uh, it's quite clear huh? this uh, Arif can never satisfy the cavitable interest the first stage test itself will fail you submit Rick will be successful in removing the private caveat. Put it very big, put it very clear stand, okay? Because eventually the question asks you whether Rick uh, can do it or not. So you could put a good conclusion uh, towards whatever you have said, okay? So we move to B. In the event Rick's success in removing uh, Arif's caveat, can Lily enter another private caveat on the document of title to the house based on the same SPA? So you must refer. You must make sure you have briefly intro who is Lily. So I will start my answer in such a way. Lily is the core buyer of Rick House who entered SPA together with Arif. And the said SPA was validly terminated by Rick. So... I put my grounds already uh, very clear that actually Lili uh, entered the private caveat on the same land, on the same ground, similar to uh, Arif, you know. So I made reference to this section 329 sub rule 2, National Land Code, whereby the court has ordered the removal of private caveat under section 327 or refuse an extension of time. Huh? So we have discussed this uh, in our question A, isn't it? So 
aware registrar had removed the caveat under section 326 sub, re, sub rule 3, the registrar shall not entertain any application for entry of a further caveat if this is based on the claim as that on which the former one was based. So I use one case only to support this ruling, Damodaran against Vasu Dewa, to support section 329 sub rule 2 and put a big conclusion saying that Lili cannot enter another private caveat on the document based on the same SPA. Okay, that's all. Five marks. Don't write too long. Uh. Don't write too long. As long as you get the law correct, uh, I think it's more important rather than keep on mentioning unnecessary uh, case law and also principles. Okay? So question C. <coughs> Rick seeks your advice whether the registrar caveat can be removed by way of court order. So advise Rick. Hmm. So I will say based on the facts, what happened? Actually, Rick had applied, isn't it? After, like, after two weeks, he received the registrar caveat. He did approach the registrar to remove the registrar caveat. So I put in one section, section 321, sub rule A, National Land Code. However, his application was rejected. Therefore, I rely further on section 321, sub rule C. Okay, sub rule C of the law to claim that uh, you, he can apply because he's the registered proprietor uh, for the court to remove this uh, registrar caveat. That means he applied for the court, court give order to the registrar, registrar, remove the, the registrar caveat. So I again use one more section, section 418 sub rule 1. Since Rick is aggrieved by the decision, of the registrar who had rejected his application. So Rick should file an appeal to High Court within three months after the said decision had been communicated to him. Tan Su Bing against Tan Tui Fok. Uh, and you put a submission. The registrar caveat could be removed by court order. Okay? But he has to probably clear the income tax. Lah. But I did not elaborate much on the income tax issue. Okay. And uh, question six, uh, okay, question six, it worded in such a way. Harry asked his friend Musa for 500,000 ringgit as a friendly loan. So Musa actually agreed to give Harry the loan, but he wanted security for the loan. He, Harry deposited the document of his title uh, to his shop lot as security. So both Harry and Musa know that Harry's shop lot is valued at approximately 800,000 ringgit. So 300,000 ringgit more than the uh, loan amount. Eh? So Harry promised to repay the loan within six months. So this is a friendly loan. This is probably some sort of uh, uh, lien, lah, but this is not properly executed. Lah. And this is not the issue of uh, discussion as well. So Harry actually signed a few documents and forms as requested by Musa for the loan. And copies of these loans and uh, these documents and forms were never given to Harry. So what happened next? Huh? So about four months later, um, Harry went to see Musa. He wanted to repay the friendly loan in full and asked for the return of document of title to his shop, lot, uh, shop house from Musa. However, Harry was unable to meet Musa. Harry later realized that Musa was missing and nowhere to be found, absconded. Lah. So Harry conducted a land search and discovered that his shop lot had been transferred to Bobo, who is now the registered owner of the shop lot, uh, shop house. Okay. Further investigation revealed that one of the forms Harry had signed was actually form 14. Uh, a, that means uh, MOT is there. Lah. He's actually transferring the land to Bobo already. Okay. And uh, in fact, this was never disclosed to Hari by Musa because previously the fact suggested that uh, Musa was trying to cheat uh, 
hurry or defraud him and enter and sign some documents which is not known by Hari. And then Hari's signature was actually witnessed by Mr. Tipu, an advocate and solicitor practicing under the name and style of uh, Tipu and Partners. Hari inquired bar counsel, discover no such legal firm, huh? never registered. Huh? So there's an issue of uh, section 340 here in regards to the indivisibility of the title. You all agree with me. Eh? They also confirmed that there are no advocate and solicitor by the name of Tipu. Okay, so Tipu never exists, lah, but there is a sign, maybe with a chalk, that claiming that he's a advocate and solicitor. So the first question asks us to discuss, in your opinion, does Bobo have an indivisible title? Your answer must refer to the provision in National Land Code and relevant case. Okay, so quite straightforward question. Okay, so how do we discuss? I'll go, go on like this. Again, I will make sure that uh, I know what the question asks and I'm clear with the relationship of the parties. This is just my style. Lah. Whether you, you have your own style, please go ahead. But this is my style. Okay, so Musa is who? Musa is the one that give friendly loan, 800k. Lian signed document, then subsequently gone, absconded. And Bobo, immediate purchaser. Why I say it's an immediate purchaser? Because Form 14A uh, signed by Hari, directly transferred to Bobo, you know. Okay, Bobo, you know. Yeah. So, issue of fraud and attestation weakness. Okay, Tipu. So, we must argue based on whatever we understood so far. Lah. Hmm. So this is how I will start my answer. Okay. Sometimes you can memorize. <laughs> uh, especially when you are dealing with uh, indivisibility issues. Huh? Okay, you can memorize. You can memorize the script as such. Malaysia land law is based on torrent system where registration means everything, something like that. It's a good start, but you, you will not go wrong. This is to say in simpler term, whoever names appears on the register, uh, he shall process the legal ownership towards the said land. So I make my stand very clear eh, because I want to rely on section 340 sub rule 1 to claim that Bobo has the name already in the land title. Therefore, section 340 sub rule 1 provides that she will enjoy the indefeasible title or interest. And then subsequently, of course, there will be some issues. Ma. Otherwise, you just conclude here, things will be very easy, isn't it? So nevertheless, the fact suggests that there are some exceptions where the said indefeasibility of the title could be reshaped. That means to say something that can disturb la, the indefeasibility title not currently possessed by Bobo. So, Again, I list out the issues because they are possible of fraud or misrepresentation on part of Musa. Okay, so how I make I advance my argument is as such. Huh? So I put it one possible of fraud misrepresentation. I straight away make it quite big here unless I miss in my subsequent uh, answer. Uh, I make it clear that I'm relying on section 340 sub rule 2 sub rule A. I said that the fact suggested that Hari signed some documents and forms and requested by Musa for the loan. So this whole uh, sentence I extract from the question. So Hari would not have realized those documents were meant for transfer of title to establish fraud according to Thaili Finance uh, against official assignee. The burden is on Musa because uh, whatever. There you go. It's not on Musa, it's actually on Hari. Okay. Wait, huh? let me just make one correction. Because uh, this uh, newly, freshly back answer, you know. <laughs> so the burden is on Arif. Uh, is it Arif? Uh? Wait, Hari. Hari on balance of probabilities, okay, Sinaya and Sun, you use one case, to establish there is actual fraud. 
Okay, fraud must be prior. Okay, prior or at the time of registration, and then the said fraud must be brought home by Bobo. Eh? So three things you make it very short and sweet. Actual fraud, fraud must be prior or at the time of registration, and fraud eh, actually not brought by. Musa, you know, Musa is not the party uh, involved in the in the what we call dealing, you know. He's just a froster. So you can see, uh, okay. Yeah, keep on using Musa. Hari. Okay. So uh so I will dismiss it actually. Okay. So to establish misrepresentation, uh, Harry must establish that Bobo had made a false representation, positive assertion, where he had relied and acted open. So the com uh, the elements of fraud and also misrepresentation, I already summarized in a very brief, brief manner, as you can see here. No need to argue there's no actual fraud, nah, provided this and that, because this is likely uh, this, uh, what we call this, under this limb, uh, uh, you cannot establish also. Why I said so? Okay, I said the facts are insufficient to ascertain Bobo had been a privy of the said fraud or misrepresentation. Probably Bobo is an innocent individual who had paid the money to Musa. We never know. So we cannot bring in a lot of its assumptions here. We can only state based on the question's facts itself. So I will say that the facts did not actually reveal the nexus and also the details of transaction of Bobo and Musa as well, because we don't know what are the dealings between them. Okay, Therefore, it will be unlikely that Hari could establish fraud or misrepresentation. So, I submit, Bobo's title could not be affected by Section 340, Subrule 2, Subrule A. Okay, second thing. Uh, Insufficient or void instrument, section 340, subrule 2, subrule C. Okay, it came to the light that the Tipu was actually not a genuine advocate and solicitor, correct? Registered in the role. And Tipu is actually not the rightful and legitimate officer to attest the signature. He cannot attest the executions of instrument affecting the dealing. Okay. Here, what is the dealing? Transfer. Form 14. Okay. 14A. That one. You cannot attest because you are not a real lawyer. So, pursuant to uh, para 1, subrule 1, subrule E, or you can just write fifth schedule. Uh, just put fifth schedule. Section 211 National Land Code. The fact that Tipu is the Testation witness for Hari eh, contravene the law. You can just submit as such. Therefore, the said contract, I mean the said uh, contract for sale, the SPA, could be uh, insufficient or void for this ground. So this is very clear already. Okay, section 340, subrule 2, subrule C. Then Bobo will not get an indefeasible title. Okay. Subsequently, you must also uh, address the third issue. Immediate purchaser. Can Bobo claim protection from section 340 subrule 3 or not? Okay, so I will quickly uh, run through whatever I need to write. You know, if you have time, only you write some uh, fancy theories, uh, your bonsom bonyane, all that case. Uh, you, you can add in. So what, what are the previous decisions? What is the now this decision now? Uh, but if you are in a hurry, these are the essential ones that I think you should put. Okay, you must not miss. So you straight away jump to the point that it appears on the fact that Bobo had acquired the title directly from Hari. Okay, so Bobo is the immediate purchaser of the shop house, and Bobo could not rely on section 340, subrule 3, subrule A to protect her title. I put it very clear as Malaysia has practiced defer indefeasibility. No need to explain much. Okay, According to the case of Tan Ying Hong, only a subsequent bona fide purchaser will be protected under the Act. So, you see, huh? in conclusion, because 
fraud and misrepresentation personally I think cannot be established lah, because Musa is never the one that appears with the the name is not in the title so how do you want to bring in him without sufficient uh, facts to support your stand so I will just submit uh, insufficient uh, what uh, instrument of the dealing on the part of illegitimate attestation weakness. So section two, uh, three, four, O, sub rule two, sub rule B will set in. The title acquired by Bobo is defeasible. So this is my conclusion to the question. I said it's defeated. Lah. This Bobo cannot enjoy indefeasibility. Okay, so this is my answer for this. And uh, okay, subsequently, uh, question two Can Bobo claim that she, he is a bona fide purchaser for value? Okay, so uh, there's a bit of uh, jumble up of the, yeah, it should be here. Okay. So I use the reference to provide the definition. I, I use one case law to define what is bona fide purchaser uh, with good faith and also for valuable consideration. So you can fall back on your section 340 sub rule 3 because it con confer protection for such person, isn't it? With good faith and also valuable consideration. The case that I only remember up to now uh, is Sivam, uh, T. Sivam case against public bank. And uh, it simply lists down one, two, three, four. But this list is not as exhaustive. Uh. You can memorize it for the sake of exam. Okay, good faith does not simply mean absence of fraud, deceit, or dishonesty. It requires acting honestly and reasonably or fairly. That means to take any ordinary precautions ought to be taken. Lah. And the elements of good faith are not closed. And it's not enough for purchaser to show merely there's absence of fraud, deceit, or uh, dishonesty and element of carelessness and negligence also can negate good faith. Okay, uh, because we have very little information, you know. So this is my again my personal opinion. Okay, the facts given did not provide adequate information on Bobo. There's only merely one sentence only that Bobo had the title with his with her name on. So I really did not know whether she could satisfy the criteria as in T C Bam or not. Okay, then what should I write? She may claim to be the bona fide uh, purchaser for valuable consideration, but even if she does so, uh, she will not enjoy the indefeasibility for the reason that she's the immediate purchaser. Again, I repeat myself. Lah. Okay, mm. she cannot claim. Tan Ying Hong case again. Okay, so I leave it open ended because I do not know. So again, don't assume things. Lah. Again, don't assume things. So we go to question B. So uh, if I do not remember wrongly, huh, this question is uh, being labeled as independent and separately. Sometimes you have to see. Huh? So bear trust is a new question, you know that is totally independent from the main question itself, from the principal question. So it's like a sub-question. Okay? So we go to... Huh, my answer is this. So I use reference uh, of section 6 and section 3. You just define uh, whenever there's a lacuna in the local law, then English common law can set in. And bear trust is actually a English doctrine. Okay, English law doctrine. And I will use very brief, uh, one very famous case of Borneo housing, mortgage finance against time engineering to define what is uh, bear trust. We have uh, three criteria. Okay, number one is the SPA must be paid fully and you have executed the memorandum of uh, the transfer, okay? So this is quite simple, uh, this question. I think everybody can 
answer. And then you can use the case of Temonggong Securities. And then you highlight the importance of uh, bad trust. Because bad trust uh, uh, is, how to say, and the SBA itself uh, is not being fully registered. Uh, something has, must have gone wrong. But then it's already being signed. And then the money has been paid. Okay. So actually the ownership, uh, the beneficiary interest uh, had been all vested with the new buyer, you know. So in this kind of thing, uh, when there are some competing equitable interests, uh, bear trust is the number one, you know, number one that will be followed by a pot, you know. That means whoever that got the bear trust uh, will win over any equitable interest, for example, equitable charge, your equitable, what we call mortgages, all that cannot win. Bad trust win. Okay. So this is how important is it. And in submission, just put it very short lah, because six mark don't write too much. And bad trust is well recognized by Malaysia judicial approach, as simple as that. Okay. So we go to the last question. Wow, finally. Where were we? Okay, question uh, seven. Toto had charged his property to Maju Bank as security for loan for a loan sum of 500,000 ringgit and Toto defaulted in the repayment of the loan. So the bank commenced for closure, proceeding against the property and obtain an order for sale. Okay, so on the auction date, now what happened? Upin was successful bidder of the property at purchase price of 400,000 ringgit. A deposit of sum of 10% uh, was paid uh, to the court. So the proclamation of sale states that the balance purchase price uh, must be paid. As we all know, 120 days. Uh, okay. So what happened? Upin also discovered that Toto had recently rented out the property to his friend, Injam. There was no mention of the tenancy in the proclamation of sale or any endorsement in the document of the title to the property. So uh, question A, Roman 1. In your opinion, is the judicial sale to open, open issues of the certificate of sale subject to tenancy with Pinjam? Okay, so that means to say when Upin paid the money, bought the property from this auction, does this Upin need to buy the tenancy along with him or not? Okay, I'll put it this way. Huh? So I'll... Uh, I'll, I'll say that on the facts given, Toto had rented out the property to Pinjam without any re uh, written consent by the Chaji Maju Bank. So the said tenancy was not endorsed on the register of the land pursuant to Chapter 7 of Part 18 of National Land Code. So this is my first submission. You do not have the consent from the bank because you already go for that long, isn't it? So you need the cons. How can you uh, rent out your property that is already being uh, auctioned? Cannot. So you must inform the bank first. And some more, you did not register. These are two fatal things uh, that you must mention. So I use by virtue of section 267, sub rule 2, in the absence of consent in writing and endorsement, UPIN will not take the certificate of sale subjected to tenancy with Pinjam. Even though Pinjam could show that tenancy agreement was one of the kind that is exempted from registration because tenancy sometimes can go below three years, so no need to register, isn't it? Under section 213, sub rule 3. But pursuant to section 267, sub rule 3, since it does not become protected by the endorsement, eh? Uh, Upin shall not be bound with the tenancy after the foreclosure. So after saying all that, I use different style. Uh, I use the case referred Hotel Ambassador Sandiran Bahad against C Power Sandiran Bahad. Okay, don't put it there. Uh, comma and C. You know, use the word S E E. You ask the examiner to see this Hotel Ambassador case. How she is going, he or she is going to see, you must use some proper and standard words. Lah. Okay? So, in legal practice, sometimes we draft our submission as well. So, 
this is one of the style, okay, that you can put in your reference, your authority, okay, to support whatever your argument as above, okay. And uh, question two, question two also quite easy. Roman two, in the event Upin is unable to pay the balance price within 120 days, can Maju Bank grant further extension of 30 days? Okay, so again, don't jump into your M&J frozen fruit. I know this is a famous case and you know it by your heart, but you statute first, can I? Okay. What the statute said, you can find it here. Section 257, sub rule 1, sub rule G, uh, provide that it is a strict provision uh, that compel OPIN to pay. The, you do not need to copy whatever, uh, but you must get the thing out. Okay, and get it. Get the main idea from that provision out. Say that OPIN must pay balance price not later than 120 days. Okay, and there shall be no extension of time. Okay, in the event should Maju Bank granted the extension of time, okay, you must you must mention uh, what is the side effect if Maju Bank did not follow the law, extend time. Okay, the whole sale, uh, I mean the whole order for sale shall become illegal or unlawful. You know, Upin may not be able to enjoy the indivisibility of the title according to section. 340 sub rule 2 sub rule C because it's not lawful, correct? So MNJ frozen food again sealed. I think you can stop here because four marks. Okay. Don't dwell yourself further. Lah, okay. So last question. Azi obtained a loan from Money Bank as a security for the loan. So Aziz's father, Mahmud, had created a third-party legal charge of his land in favor of Money Bank. Unfortunately, due to an error by bank solicitor during documentation, the charge was actually registered as a first-party legal charge huh, instead of a third-party legal charge at the land register. Uh, uh, land registry. So however, the charge initial accompany the instrument or charge containing the terms of the loan clearly stated that the loan was a third-party charge. That means there are some supplementary, la, there's Lampera la, saying that, oh, actually the loan is third-party, but it was entered wrongly eh, as a first-party legal charge. So Money Bank eh, was now very panicked and nervous eh, because they discovered the error and is worried that the charge is defective due to insufficient instrument. So you must advise Money Bank what to be done in order to rectify the situation. So what you should go. Okay. You must submit. Okay. First thing, the error in Form 16A, Section 242, Sub Rule 1, may render the charge of Money Bank to be defeasible, okay? Be defeasible on the ground of insufficient or void instrument. So this may carry a... So money's bank concern is very true, you know. Sometimes uh, you have a defective charge. Huh? Then later on, you have a hard time, you know. You have to argue on the basis that you are actually an equitable charge, you know, instead of a proper registered uh, char chargey. Because registered chargey, you can do all sorts of things, you know. You can go for read of pos possession of that property. You can go for order of sale. Easy, you can do that without any argument. But let's say something wrong with your documentation, the whole instrument can become void. So, sala, you cannot get the feasible title. Okay? So, money bank could actually apply to registrar. So, this is my, my opinion, uh, what money bank should do. So Money Bank could apply to registrar to make corrections of errors in the document of title by virtue of section 384, sub rule 1, sub rule C. This is the power vested uh, by registrar to rectify errors. Okay. And if the said land is under land office title, the state approval, the, the state director's approval must be obtained. Okay. But this is the approach huh? I advise Money Bank. Huh? You must see my approach. Huh? So I will say that Money Bank's approach to 
registrar would fail. Why? We refer to the case of Island Peninsula Development Berhad against legal advisor Kedah. The power of the registrar under section 380 sub rule 1 is only confined the mistake done by the registrar and it does not actually cover the mistake done by the solicitor of money bank. That means money bank's only lawyer uh, made mistake. Uh, the lawyer and the money bank will bear the bad consequence. Not uh, having anything to do with the registrar. You know. So section 380, you cannot invoke actually. But you have to apply. Later on, you see how I st uh, structure my ideas. Uh, okay? Since the fact suggested that the error was done by money bank solicitor, it is likely that application uh, by money bank under section 380 AO sub rule 1 shall be rejected by registrar. That one is for sure, no argument. Okay. So open the reje rejection, uh, okay, because the marks a lot, you know. So it, it's not just 3 AO, uh, it will have to be stages of uh, procedure. Okay. So I go on. Open the re rejection. What this uh, money bank can do is okay, the money bank, he got the rejection. Because applied under section 380, registrar surely will not agree okay, to, to, to go and change uh, whatever errors that you made in the form 16A, right? So next recourse, since you got the rejection, now you, have, you can rely on section 418 to ask the court to give order to the registrar to make amendment. So this is my idea. Okay, you get me? So I will say money bank, which is aggrieved by the decision of the registrar, can appeal to high court by OS plus affidavit pursuant to section 418 National Land Code. And then subsequently, uh, the, the power vested to the court lah, to order the registrar to make amendment is actually under section 417. The court may order the registrar or LA to make amendment okay, of the said instrument. Okay? So I use the case that I found in your syllabus, the MBSB against uh, what KCSB, Consortium Sundiram Berhad. Okay? So these are my opinions on how to answer this uh, the 2001, uh, 2021 and 2022 question. All right. And I think I have some small, small mistake with the slides and also arrangement. These slides will be distributed uh, in our WhatsApp group later. Okay. Anything you all want to ask? Uh, if not, we can close the chapter and move on. Uh, because, because I only talk, uh, it's quite thirsty for me, you know. So far, okay, isn't it? Make sure you have a good, solid knowledge. Lah. Landlord cannot let go at all. Landlord must be very, very good. Okay? So, if you all have no question, I was, I was the head of the land office. Yeah, yeah. No, no, no. The uh, uh, Nagari one. Huh? It's not just the department, the like the Patupahat or Moa one. No, no, no. It's the Negri Johor, Negri Slango one. Okay. If you all have any question, uh, feel free to post in the group line because I think this is your best chance already to learn. All right. Okay. If there's no further question, then we end our session. Thank you very much for joining me. So uh, uh Doctor, yeah. got one question. One just to clarify some things here. Ah, sale, can, can. sale by private treaty. Ah. See, uh, pursuant to section 